Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is Nick Morgan. Grace Under Pressure is a LinkedIn live show that focuses uh, on what's too often dismissed as the soft stuff, the caring, the commitment we exert toward others. And when you do it as a leader, as you will discover that Nick is, um, you do it for a common cause and to bring people together and you energize them. And Nick is an expert at doing that, particularly in the arena of communications. Dr. Nick Morgan, it is a pleasure to have you on the show today, sir. So, John, it's good to see you again, even in this virtual way in which we live now. Great. Uh, Nick Morgan, PhD, is one of America's, and no kidding, top communication speakers, theorists, and coaches. He writes uh, senior level speeches, CEO, and presidential level for Fortune 100, excuse me, Fortune 50. Yeah, Fortune 100 too, but Fortune 50 companies. He coaches on TED Talks and has delivered them. And he speaks all around the country and the world. Um, Nick's methods are well known because they challenge convention. And that's why I wanted to have Nick on the show today. His First book, well, I think it was, I don't know, it was first, Working the Room, How to Move People to Action yes. Through Audience-Centered uh, Speaking, was published by Harvard Business uh, Press in 2003 and made in their paperback in 2005. Uh, Nick is, um, has written several other books, and he served as the editor of the Ma Harvard Management Communication Letter, where he and I connected. And Nick gave me my first introduction to Harvard uh, Business uh, uh, Review and publication. So I owe you big time, my friend. Uh, his firm is uh, Public Words, uh, excuse me, Public Words. Mm -hmm. And I will put a link to it in the uh, our show notes. Uh, Nick, it is a great honor and pleasure to have you on the show. So thank you. So My great pleasure. And, and uh, let's, uh, let's rock and roll. Let's Let's say some communication-y sort of things. <laughs> okay, great. Your new book is Can You Hear Me? How to Connect with People in the Virtual World. So I don't know why you came across the idea of virtual. I mean, where did that come from, Nick? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could say I looked in my crystal ball and, and, and foresaw the pandemic. It was not like that at all. I had been speaking about storytelling and body language to audiences um, starting, well, a number of years ago, but this is probably three or four years ago, I started getting the question all the time. And it was the first question. So somebody had been sitting on their hand at the end of the talk, <laughs> their hand would go shooting up and they'd say, Nick, this body language stuff's all very well. It's kind of interesting, thanks. And I, yeah, okay. And I knew what was coming because then they'd say, but I never see my team. My team is based in India and in France and in California and uh, how do I read their body language? How does body language, uh, nonverbal communications, to give it the formal term, how does that get transmitted across the, these uh, uh, virtual airwaves? And and my first reaction was, well, duh, it doesn't. And, and, and then I thought, you know, that's not good enough as an yeah. no, expert no, in communications. <laughs> Got to do better than that. So, uh, so I started doing the research, uh, and I was truly surprised at what I found. And that formed the basis of the book in 2018. And and if only I had said, we live in a 100% virtual world, you know, then I'd be a genius today because I could claim I'd foreseen the pandemic. But I said we live in a half virtual, half face-to-face -face world, which was true in 2018. Yeah, certainly. And I think it's only more so obviously now. So what has changed um, since the pandemic and virtual communication, virtual presence? How do you see that, Nick? So. Yeah, it's uh, it's something everybody had to learn very, very fast who didn't have much experience with it before. And that was a surprising number of people. The the stat is uh, is often uh, a shock to people. But um, in 2018, the percentage of people, knowledge workers in Fortune 1000 companies who used video conferencing on a regular basis was, wait for it, 5%. And it went from 5% in 2018 to 100% in March 2020 in about sure. a week. And yeah. and like a lot of other things, 
digital transformations and that kind of thing that people were saying would take years. Suddenly, everybody managed to do it in a week. So that was the, that was the first big change. And of course, we all know there was a lot of awkwardness with that. And, uh, the mute button was something we all became <laughs> wearily familiar with. <laughs> yeah. and, and, but now it's, uh, it's interesting. We're in this uh, some sort of hybrid phase. And, right. and people say that wearily. But for me, this is a tremendous opportunity to figure out a kind of brilliant relationship between the hybrid and the in-person. Um, and let's make the most of that. Let's figure out how to do this in a really smart way. Well, Nick, you work with leaders at the top of the house, uh, corporate and uh, and uh, nonprofit and governmental. Mm -hmm. um, so presence is, uh, I mean, you have written a lot about it, um, as have I. And a, a, a colleague of mine, Ron Carucci, says that presence is something that must be felt. So how do we how do we convey presence on video? Um, yeah, it's uh, that's the the question or at least it has certainly been the question and it will continue to be for a while uh, the leaders i worked with almost to a person struggled with feeling disconnected from their employees uh, and so we had this interesting phenomena of employees were were saying well yeah it's not cool to be at home all the time maybe i feel a little stuck but but sure beats the commute and i'm way more productive and I don't have to listen to the annoying person in my in the next cubicle, right? So the employees were not pushing to go back to work. However, the top level executives were all saying, how soon can we get people back in the office? Yeah. Uh, because they couldn't feel that uh, connection that they need to feel in order to be effective leaders. Uh, and so that's that's been a real challenge and learning how to do that has been very and it's difficult. It's only going to become magnified. I, I don't know about your clients, but I'm guessing the same. Uh, and my client base, significant. I mean, at least 50% um, of the workforce will not be coming back um, in any significant way. Maybe a week here, or, I mean, excuse me, a, a day or two here or there. Uh, but just what you said is the commute. And, and you know, people have left city centers to live in more rural environs. Um, but this pre But we still feel we have this video presence. And um, so do you have any tips on how to be more authentic in an artificial medium? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the question. Yeah, yeah I, I can compare leadership from two companies, which I can't identify by name, but I can I can tell you one of them is a software company um, mm -hmm. and the other is a, a pharmaceutical. And uh, I was worked, happened to start working with them both right as the pandemic began. And the software company didn't miss a beat. And the leaders uh, were completely comfortable in the medium because they had actually begun the company as a work from anywhere company. The pharmaceuticals, on the other hand, what a transformation. I mean, a pharmaceutical is basically a sales force with a bunch of scientists attached. Don't call me and, and complain about that. That's an oversimplification, of course. But but a huge driving force of, of any pharmaceutical is the sales force. And they have traditionally relied on face-to-face -face meetings with doctors in their offices in hospitals. And it's suddenly they... The man. Exactly. My, father was, yeah, my father was a family, uh, now passed on, but was a uh, family practice physician. And they, he always talked about the detail guys. And he was very fond of them. So yeah, they, okay. they were they were coming for him. And and it's a very mutually beneficial thing. You, the doctors learn about the latest, uh, the latest and greatest medicines and the pharmaceutical reps sell their sell their wares. And it all it's all good. Uh, but they had to learn suddenly how to do this virtually. And and also the doctors had to learn how to do it virtually. So it was a case of both sides were were really struggling. Um, just just in the technology of it, but then how to effectively communicate and build trust. And especially the thing they found the hardest was the new relationship. Um, how do you establish a new relationship? Now, if if you'd already known somebody before, if you you and the doc were already good buddies and, and you uh, uh, had had a number of meetings with that person, then it wasn't so hard to continue it in the virtual world. But, but establishing a new relationship is a challenge. And so um, I encourage them to take some lessons from the software company. And the first one is you have to tell a heck of a great story. You have to be very clear on what your purpose and mission is and you have to be able to articulate that in 
30 seconds, in three minutes, in 15, 20 minutes, in 45 minutes. You, know, you need to know all the versions and you need to be good at doing it. And it's got to be compelling. And, and the pharmaceuticals had had to do that in quite the same way. There was a sort of an implicit assumption as they met with the doctors that they were all in this business together. And that doesn't translate as well virtually because the virtual communication is like turning the volume down. It's like putting on, uh, putting on a bit of blinders or a mask or something. Things just don't get through as loud and clear as they do face to face. Right. Right. So, you said something intriguing that caught my attention when you were saying about the shirt. Obviously, I'm right in sync with you when you said the third second and two minute, three minute. And you said 45 minutes. So where does that 45 come in? How does that come into play, Nick? That seems ungodly long. I mean, if we're all in long meetings, but um, yeah. so w what's going on in that 45 minutes? <laughs> well, in, in 45 minutes, you can uh, begin to uh, put out uh, true thought leadership. You can begin to uh, develop an idea uh, and put it out there. And that's actually an essential piece of any organization's um, face uh, facing uh, mission to the world. In other words, if, if uh, you can't articulate in that long form something that sounds like more than just uh, we need to make a buck or, or we're in it to uh, sell our wares or something like that, there's got to be a high level purpose uh, that comes across. And that and that usually is uh, not uh, not a, a, a direct sales uh, speech. Right. It's a, it's about something else. Correct. It's Absolutely. about communication. If it's software, it's about efficiency or it's about uh, uh, bringing people together or, or uh, in increasing the throughput of your uh, uh, of your office functions or whatever it happens to be. That's uh, it's it's the uh, uh, it's, it's being able to articulate that that larger purpose that uh, that you have to do so that that stands. Um, that starts to stand outside the company and, and the company uh, or the organization gets to be known for it. Um, even, uh, even when somebody isn't deliberately connecting uh, with a, in a sales situation. Now it's great stuff. Now we're, we are deliberately focused on the virtual, uh, but there is another part of virtual in your world and mine, and that's communication. And that's something that you have spent your career doing. And you have so it gets down to the nuts and bolts of, of putting words together and the cohesive arguments and, and things like that. So you have a concept called anchoring. Explain what that is, uh, Nick. So. Um, well, when you when you anchor an idea, uh, you you uh, begin to define it uh, in the in the setting that you're communicating with. So to to uh, uh, to give an hilarious and simple example, if uh, if I walk into the into the sales room of a uh, of a car dealership because I'm looking for a new car. And what am I thinking? Maybe I want to get a somewhere between 30 and 50 grand somewhere in there. That's what mm -hmm. cars seem to go for these days. Uh, and I run into a salesperson. The salesperson says, come over here and look at this. This is so cool. And it's a Lamborghini. Right? <laughs> and it goes for a quarter of a million dollars. And I'm looking at it and ooing and eyeing if, if I'm a car buff. And, and I say, yeah, how much is that? And the salesman drops the price and, on me. And, and all of that anchors for me my uh, notion of what a car should be and should cost at a much higher level. So when I walk back over to the other side of the room where I might realistically be buying, suddenly that $50,000 car seems like a steal. It's a fifth of the cost of this. <laughs> Only. <other>. Yeah. <laughs> so anchoring works like that. That's a, a simple sort of sales situation, but it works like that in many uh, Many forms. So of grounding your grounding your argument with a, uh, a a predicate, so you know where you're going. Got it. Okay. Now, um, you draw attention to the word "hear." Isn't that the same as listening? Or oh, uh, <laughs> good question, John. You're uh, you've done your homework. Yeah, uh, I first ran across that word. Um, when I was studying uh, back, in fact, when I was uh, still uh, teaching in the academic world, um, and I wanted to teach uh, Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. And as everybody who studied it knows, it's one of the 
shortest, greatest speeches ever given. Right. Rough, roughly 248 words, depending on which version you look at. Right. Um, and it's in very plain language, except for the four score and and uh, so on years ago. It's otherwise in very plain uh, language. And the, the there was something about it, though, that has a kind of uh, magical quality, as if there was an incantation involved in this uh, in this uh, speech. And you come away from it thinking, yes, something has been said here, which, which uh, creates a sense of place. And how did he do that? Um, and I went through the speech looking for the clues. And the fact is that he uses the word here in that uh, more often than in average uh, usage in speech. So he is saying here over and over again, he uses it eight times in the course of 248 words. It's right. extraordinary. You don't notice it when you're reading it, but what it does is it anchors the, uh, the, the uh, heart and the, the, the soul of the text in this place where so many people died and what, and the place that he's trying to make uh, uh, a place of remembrance and, and grieving and uh, reverence for many, many years to come. And he succeeded, and, as we know. Without question. And uh, anecdotally, um, you know, he followed uh, Everett Horton, I believe, that, who mm -hmm. gave a two hour, 30 minute presentation. And Lincoln thought, well, you know, I kind of just sort of winged it, whatever. And, and uh, Horton walked over to him and just said, you know, in our parlance, you not, <laughs> you knocked a home run. So right. he hit it over the fence. You know? Yeah, the so, story goes that, yeah, that he said, uh, uh, my speech will be remembered for a few days. Yours is going to be remembered forever. So if he actually said that, good for him. <laughs> he was, <laughs> he was a, a better uh, a soothsayer than he was a speaker. But yeah. he, to be yeah. fair to him, he was the one of the famous, most famous speakers of his day. And, yes. and, and that was the norm of the day, to give very three-hour, two-and-a-half-hour, uh, very long speeches. So he right. wasn't doing anything really... Uh, uh, astonishing in his time it was lincoln that did the surprising thing by keeping sure. it short. and lincoln was fully capable of going the distance for presentations and Absolutely. and all of that um, now we're going to flip it completely because get back to your speech writing roots or mm -hmm. what you still practiced um and that's you know there's always this press to keep it short and concise and we're all for that but do we miss something when we try to be too short, too concise, Nick? So, Yeah, I love that question because uh, it's a beef I had with the TED Talk from the very beginning. So TED Talks, as, as of course everyone knows, were um, 18 minutes when they started. They also went, experimented with shorter versions and they have... Uh, yeah. They have sh shorter genres that are three minutes or five minutes or what have you. Uh, but the, the standard is 18 minutes. And there's something funny about that 18 minutes, uh, and that is that um, you can present an idea in 18 minutes, and you can absorb it and be impressed by it and, and remember it and whatnot. I'm not convinced that you can fully change somebody's mind in 18 minutes in a deep and lasting way. That's an ongoing debate. Um, that I have uh, with with speech making and the length of speeches and that kind of thing. And, and the reason is you need to spend some time uh, making the audience feel the weight of the decision, whether it's it's to argue about the uh, the depth of the pain that, for which you have a solution, um, the, the complexities of the problem, or to make the, the audience feel like there's a huge opportunity out there. There's something that's so glorious that it's worth doing the work of change uh, to, uh, to, to achieve. So... Um, how long does that take is a question. And I would, I would posit that um, TED Talks are more admired than, um, than earth-shaking. Hmm. Interesting. Great. Here's a thought. I'm going to throw another curve here uh, when we're talking about this. Um, one of the things I love about great acting, and particularly television acting, the greats who are doing it more and more now, um, and it's that ability to carry an expression facially and or nuance nuance is really hard uh in a speech so, 
And so people get in trouble with that. Do you, do you ever encounter that? This is kind of my my little peeve too. So what 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 say you, Nick? So yeah. um, yes. So uh, first of all, if we're talking about uh, uh, great actors, then they are professional. Uh, professionals at experiencing emotion. They're professional yeah. emotion uh, displayers, let's say. Or they're, they're good at working with their emotions. Uh, most of the people who give speeches, the executives and the professional speakers, um, they may be charismatic. Um, they, may be, uh, they may be great emotional orators, um, but they're not used to inhabiting their emotions in quite the same way as a, as a sort of an exercise of, I'm going to take on this other character for two hours and go through a gamut, run a whole gamut of emotions with that, uh, with that character. And I might die at the end, or I might uh, uh, live happily ever after, whatever the storyline is, I'm going to go through a whole series of emotions. And that arc itself is why the audience comes to see it. Right, you want to see that change. You want to see the journey that the uh, that the actor goes on. In a speech, typically, you're going to run through three or four emotions in, say, a 45-minute or hour-long speech. It's not as facile. You don't have moments. Uh, you don't have a scene uh, like in Waiting for Godot, where suddenly you know, one of them turns to the other and says, "You know, life has no meaning," and they start crying. Well, right? well, I think you and I have both heard speeches where Waiting for Godot is light entertainment. <laughs> Uh, he, yeah, maybe that was not the best example. Maybe we should go with Shakespeare or something. But um, yeah, I don't know why waiting for Godot occurred to me. But no, uh, well, uh, <laughs> uh, but the the uh, the the actor, the professional actor, as you say, that, that this is a golden age of television acting, uh, and uh, we're, we are watching just some of the greats do magnificent jobs. Uh, night after night. And uh, for a speaker, the job of a speaker is slightly different. Um, it's similar. Similar skills are needed, but it's slightly different in that you're supposed to take the audience um, on, a, on a journey. Um, but it's not uh, necessarily the, uh, as, as, uh, as steep or as huge or as, as uh, grand, eloquent an arc as it would be in a movie or a play or a TV show. Right. While we're talking on acting, I, I do believe, and I've coached speakers this way, is speaking is acting. You are on stage and you have to play the part and you are not professional and you're not dissembling, but you're an actor. Would you agree with that? So. Uh, yes, absolutely. With some caveats. Absolutely. Uh, you are performing. There's no question. And you have to, as Aristotle said, he realized this low these many years ago. You know, you you need to be both dulce et utile. You need to both uh, have uh, some impart some knowledge and also uh, be uh, entertaining. Uh, and that was the distinction he made. He said it wasn't enough just to be brilliantly informative. You also had to be entertaining. So um, that's uh, that's still the case now. So you are you are acting in that sense, but uh, you're playing yourself. Yes. And so th th while you're playing yourself as a part in in a, in a literal sense, right? Um, you're, it's also a different uh, relationship with the audience because uh, it, actors talk about the fourth wall and, and basically you're, you're up there on stage living in a little domain there where you're playing a character as if no one was watching. And of course, there are uh, plays that play with that fourth wall and, and break it and so on and so forth. But on the whole, what you're doing is presenting a little story that the audience gets to watch with a speaker you're trying to connect directly into the minds and hearts and souls of those of that audience um, and the the speech may be more or less interactive but it's very much a, uh, a in the largest sense an interaction with the audience so that's that's fundamentally different so you're not acting in quite the same sense but nonetheless i agree with you in the sense that all the same skills are involved you need to have yeah. a strong voice. You need to be able to know how to stand on stage. You need to know how to gesture and move and do all the things that actors think about. Them. 
No, without question. And I think it's also the idea of projection, not simply in vocal or but put yourself into it and that, you know, um, you owe it to these, you owe it to the audience. If certainly if you're in a leadership position, that's typically your followers, you owe it to them to invest yourself in that presentation. And do you agree with that? So, yes. And, and I think that's something that's changed even while you and I have, uh, have experienced our working careers, our working lives. I think when I started um, a speaker, and a leader to a certain extent could get away with much less um, uh, personal authenticity. In other words, you could just be um, the mouthpiece of the company at some level. Now we expect there's been a revolution. Part of it has to do with social media and with the internet and with the, the bringing uh, into a more intimate space, the, uh, all these things that we're talking about, the, the kind of public discourse. Uh, and so we expect our leaders to be more authentic. We expect to see a, a piece of them in order to believe that they're for real. Uh, and th that's a that's a big change. Uh, and I think it's a change for the good on the whole. Um, and I think it's, it's fine now to demand leaders to be more authentic. I'm fully on board with that. But it is a, it is a change and it requires um, uh, more from leaders than they used to have to do. And you know, one of the discussions I often have with, with uh, executives who are trying to uh, up their game to, be, uh, to have more of a presence, more charisma, or more executive presence, I'll say, so what part of you are you willing to reveal to that audience? Because on the other side of it, we don't want TMI. We don't want too much information. We don't want to know the whole story. You know, yeah. we, don't, we don't, there's a lot of, about our leaders that we just don't care about. Right. Uh, but uh, we want to know enough to feel like we've seen a bit of that real person. Well, here's, here's, uh, we're coming toward the end, but there's a one thing I want to raise, and, and it's the idea, and I know you get asked this, Nick, should my speech be funny? So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, step away from the humor. Everybody wants to be funny. Uh, and uh, let me just give two quick uh, points about that. Um, everybody wants to be funny because to make people laugh, especially in an anxious time, it feels like a gift. And, and you get that nice warm response from the audience. You think they love me. It's great. So who doesn't want that? Right? However, however, uh, the first thing uh, to think about is that the stand up comic uh, and with people use that a lot as a model now for how they'd like to be received as speakers. The stand-up comic is doing something very different than the, uh, than the, the speaker uh, who is uh, talking about a company or an organization or an idea or something like that. Um, the stand-up comic is trying to make the audience laugh and trying to make the audience laugh at a particular rate, you know, a few laughs a, every minute or more. Yeah. Um, and th that's fundamentally, and forgive me all the comics out there, I love you, that's fundamentally a manipulative act. Mm -hmm. And I think a speaker needs to respect the audience and walk with the audience on this journey, this intellectual and emotional journey of discovery that, that is the subject of which you're speaking. Um, and I don't think that the, the goal of it should be just to get the audience to laugh. Now, if you can throw in a few jokes every now and then and kind of lighten things up, who doesn't, who doesn't want to do that? Um, the other thing is, the other thing is, um, it's hard. And, <laughs> oh, yeah. and, uh, the old saying is, uh, 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 life is easy. Comedy is hard. Comedy is hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and it takes a lot of practice. And if you listen to the greats like Jerry Seinfeld and, and, and the others, they will tell you that they develop material for one set over a year. Right. Yes. And with the executives that you and I work with, you know, they might have a few weeks to prepare a presentation. <laughs> and so I get a little nervous if they say, yeah, let's insert a few jokes and let's hope <laughs> this thing goes well. Uh, That's great. You know, oh, great. Yeah. Nick, sadly, we are rushing to the end. And I always like to ask guests, and I didn't clear with you in the beginning, but do you have a story on grace that you want to share with us? So. Mm. Oh, there's so many. Uh, the... <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you one that I love and is, uh, do we have like two minutes? Do we have? Yes, yeah. please. Okay. Um, so, uh, and it's the Make reason it I'm funny too. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's the reason I'm alive today. Uh, and it's not what you think. Um, uh, my, uh, grandmother wanted to go to college 
and her father didn't think girls should go to college. Mm. And she complained a lot about that. And he finally said, when you graduate from high school, I will send you uh, to Europe on a vacation and you can get a sort of education by wandering around the capitals of Europe. So this was a thing people did back in those days. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, this is the early 1900s. Um, so off she went, very uh, feeling like she got cheated, but she went, she didn't want to turn that down. Right? Yeah. This was her one, her one shot. So she went off with a couple of girlfriends and they had a great time going around uh, Europe and they came back. Um, and in those days you could meet with the, a uh, cruise line, the the uh, the ship that you were going to get on in London before you went to Folkestone or wherever it was to mm -hmm. get on the on the ship, and you could check out the food, and the officers would introduce themselves. It was all very charming and posh, um, and you could you could do that. You could go around to several of the uh, of the cruise lines of the of the uh, ship lines and wow. check them out. Compare. Yeah. Well, Daddy had bought my grandma a ticket um, on the one line. And she was wandering around to the other cruise ships, uh, the other ships um, that sailed between L London and New York. Um, and she went to the, uh, the German line cocktail party. And she thought the officers were better looking and the food was tastier there. So without telling her dad, she jumped onto the other ship with her friends. Well, the way she tells the story... This is grandma now. Uh, and so I take no responsibility for this story. But she says she was on the quarterdeck with the captain having champagne because apparently they had kind of a spark. Might have been a lieutenant. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, she told that as the captain. And they see fireworks off in the distance. And she says, what's that? And he says, oh, that's the fireworks being set off by this uh, grand first voyage of this ship uh, that uh, has just set sail it's just over the horizon and and uh and she says oh what's that and he says uh that's the titanic and she says oh that's the one my daddy wanted me to go on he had a ticket for me on the titanic and i decided to go on your ship instead and the captain said well you missed out on a great ride um, and then it was uh those were of course the signal flares the distress flares they were sending off um and and so uh uh, they didn't find that out for a couple of hours uh, and mm. they charged off to, to try to help. But as we all know, they arrived too late to really to save right. many lives. But, wow. uh, That's but she, a story. <laughs> she says, yeah, I'm, you're, she always would look at me when she told this story. She would say, you're only alive today because I disobeyed my father, but it was the only time I ever did it. Oh, that's I'm great. Not, what a great I'm not, quite story. Sure, I'm not quite sure what the moral of that is, but it was certainly oh, a moment of grace. Oh, that's great. Um, Nick, it's been a pleasure to talk to you today. How can people find you? So, uh, Right on the website, there's the usual contact uh, things, uh, publicwords.com. Great. And those notes will be there. Uh, Nick, it's been a pleasure to have you. Thanks. And with that, we're going to close out. So, Thank you so much.